It's May 1862. The Civil War is now 13 months old, and Jefferson County here in Virginia has been in the heart of it, in the midst of it, from day one. Now, since the beginning of the war, things have been fairly quiet here. Uh, there's been no battles in Jefferson County. There's been no real significant actions in Jefferson County. In fact, the armies have moved elsewhere. Now, the focus is on the Shenandoah Valley, very much on what's happening in the Valley of Virginia in the spring of 1862. And the reason that that principal focus is on the Valley is because Richmond itself, the capital of the Confederacy, is now being threatened. George McClellan, George B. McClellan, commander of the Army of the Potomac, is now outside of Richmond, threatening the capital, moving against Richmond, moving, inching closer and closer day by day to a point where he soon will be within visual sight of the Confederate capital. He has tens of thousands of men, more men than the Confederates have defending the capital city. And so Confederate strategy is calling for some sort of diversion, some sort of distraction, something that's going to take attention away from Richmond and place it elsewhere. So the elsewhere that the Confederates focus on is the Shenandoah Valley. Now in the Shenandoah Valley is Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Major General Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Jackson, you might recall, had his very first assignment of the Civil War here in the Shenandoah Valley at Harper's Ferry. He was placed here by Lee to command in April May of 1861 as the Confederates were concentrating troops here in the northeastern part of the Shenandoah Valley. And so what Jackson is asked to do is to create some sort of diversion that takes attention away from Richmond and hopefully even moves troops away from Richmond. The Shenandoah Valley has always been an area of concern to President Lincoln and his administration because when you look at the geography of the valley, the valley itself runs kind of northeast southwest and it goes so far northeast that the northern part of the Shenandoah Valley is far north of Washington meaning that if Confederates were in the northern part of the valley and they were to cross the Potomac River and come into Maryland, they could literally move against Washington from the north and the west, thus putting the city, the capital city of the United States, in peril. So Lincoln, at this time, kind of has one eye on Richmond and the other eye on the valley of Virginia, very concerned about any Confederate movements out here. While well, Jackson begins to move, early May. Now he's not here in this section of the valley. He's not in Jefferson County. He's much further south. He's in the vicinity of Stanton, Virginia in Augusta County. But Jackson begins to move and he begins to pull the federal forces deeper and deeper, further and further south into the valley. And then towards the last week of May 1862, Jackson begins a brilliant series of maneuvers that outflanks, outmaneuvers his opponent, Union General Nathaniel Banks, and this results in a series of actions where Jackson is victorious and forces U.S. retreats. First he begins at Front Royal, then he moves against Winchester. The Yankees that are holding Winchester under banks are so badly defeated there that they go racing north and they don't stop their retreat until they literally cross the Potomac River and come across the river at Williamsport into Maryland. And so at that point, Jackson has basically cleared the Shenandoah Valley of Yankees. He's caught the attention of Lincoln and also McClellan at Richmond. The only thing between Jackson and Washington are a few Federals at Harper's Ferry, which is known as the Railroad Brigade, under the command of Colonel Dixon Stansberry Miles. But that's not going to stop Jackson, and Jackson knows it. And Jackson's goal is to clear every blue coat out of the Shenandoah Valley, including those few that are remaining in Harper's Ferry. So now we have a race a race. Lincoln and his administration trying to keep Jackson cornered, bottled up in the valley, making certain that he doesn't come into Maryland, presents no threat to Washington. They begin to send reinforcements to Colonel Miles here at Harper's Ferry, coming out of the Washington area, using train, using the railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, to move troops from the area of the capital here to Harper's Ferry. Now normally that would be a three to four day march but because of the railroad, you could move troops from Washington to Baltimore and then from Baltimore to Harper's Ferry in less than six hours. 
And so thousands of soldiers who are in the defenses of Washington begin to move via the railroad to here to Harper's Ferry. Now, because of the importance of this, they're going to assign a general to command this, this position. Uh, so they're going to bring somebody in who elevates himself even over command of Colonel Miles. And his name is Saxton, S-A-X-T-O-N, Rufus B. Saxton. Now, that's not a household name in the Civil War, certainly not well known. But the administration has great trust and faith in General Saxon, and they believe that he is the man to stop Stonewall Jackson here at Harper's Ferry. So Saxton himself will arrive here via railroad towards the end of May. He will take the troops that are coming uh, out of Washington and organize them. Ultimately, he's going to have nearly 8,000 United States soldiers arrive here. Now, Jackson, in the meantime, is coming down the valley, uh, arriving at Charlestown. And he doesn't initially have his entire force with him. Remember, he has sent the Yankees scurrying across the Potomac at Williamsport. Most of Jackson's forces in the vicinity of Martinsburg in the heart of the valley. And here, right here, we have Jackson starting to arrive towards Harper's Ferry, coming towards Charlestown for the purpose of trying to get all these remaining Federals out of here. We're going to set up for a possible conflict. There's no question about it. Jackson moves to Charlestown. Jackson starts to move his force, principally the Stonewall Brigade, the Stonewall Brigade that he organized and drilled and disciplined right here at Harper's Ferry during the first two months of the war, right here on top of Bolivar Heights. These are local boys, many of them. Most of them are from the Shenandoah Valley. Many of them are from Jefferson County, the 2nd Virginia Infantry, for example. Most of that unit, which is part of the Stonewall Brigade, came from men who lived here in Jefferson County. And so you've got people who are really back home again, who are coming toward Harper's Ferry. They're very familiar with the ground. They know the topography. They know Bolivar Heights and the ferry quite well. So they're moving closer and closer and closer. Now Saxton knows they're coming. And so what Saxton's going to do is place his troops initially here on Bolivar Heights, along with some artillery, hoping that in the background there in the distance in the valley on Schoolhouse Ridge, that he would be able to stop Jackson. But Saxton takes a look at his line here on Bolivar Heights, and it's a long one. From the Potomac River on his right to the Shenandoah River on his left, it's nearly two miles long, and he doesn't have enough troops to occupy this position, and he knows it. And so, very concerned that Jackson would be able to outflank him, either on the Potomac River side or the Shenandoah River side, Saxton decides to move his troops from here on Bolivar Heights and put them in a new position. He moves about three quarters of a mile further to the east towards Harper's Ferry, towards the Water Gap, and he's going to place the bulk of his infantry on Camp Hill. Now Camp Hill is a knoll where the village of Harper's Ferry sits today. We kind of div divide Harper's Ferry between the lower town, which is along the rivers in the floodplain, and the upper town. And the upper town is Camp Hill. That's the knoll where Saxton is going to place the bulk of his infantry. What he's done is he's constricted his line going from two miles to a half a mile. And thousands of troops on that half mile can hold that position very well. He also is going to place artillery there. And during that, or between that three quarter of a mile from the crest here of Bolivar Heights to Camp Hill, you go down into a fairly deep chasm or ravine, and then you have to go back up again to ascend Camp Hill. In fact, it's almost 200 vertical feet up to get back up to that position. So Saxton has a good defensive position. In addition, they're going to bring guns from the Washington Navy Yard, naval cannon, typically siege cannon, cannon that you would find in Seacoast fortification. They're going to transport, the Union soldiers are, transport those Navy guns from Washington, the Washington Navy Yard, via the B&O Railroad, once again going from Washington to Baltimore, then from Baltimore to Harper's Ferry, and they're going to take those guns and drag them up Maryland Heights. Now, they don't go all the way to the top of Maryland Heights. They go about halfway up the slope, um, but there on Maryland Heights are going to place these seacoast fortifications. And these guns, is a very odd sight. You've got Union sailors on the side of a mountain, Maryland Heights, manning these naval guns. But the reason they brought these heavy artillery pieces here, not only heavy because of the shell they fired, but heavy because of their weight. One of these guns weighed nearly five tons, a five-ton cannon they dragged halfway up the slope of Maryland Heights. But they pointed it towards Bolivar Heights. They pointed it to where I am, because from Maryland Heights, which is almost, well, it's over a mile away to this position, 
those guns were very accurate and they could shell anything that appeared here on Bolivar Heights. So you can see what Saxton has done. He has constricted his line. He's got a good infantry position on high ground on Camp Hill. His flanks protected by the Potomac and Shenandoah Rivers. He's brought in artillery from Washington and he's placed on a mountain that's elevated higher than Bolivar Heights and Camp Hill so he can use plunging fire, plunging artillery fire to assault the enemy. And if Jackson gets up here on Bolivar Heights, he's going to come under the fire of those naval cannon. And if Jackson attempts to attack Camp Hill, he's going to be under that fire in the entirety. Between Bolivar Heights and Camp Hill is the village of Bolivar. So this does potentially threaten the people that live in Bolivar. If there's going to be a battle, that battle may occur in their backyard. And there's going to be an artillery bombardment. Their homes are going to be concentrated in the middle of it. So it's a very dangerous situation if you're a civilian living here in Bolivar in late May of 1862. Well, sure enough, Jackson arrives here on Bolivar Heights. And he begins to threaten and demonstrate against Rufus Saxton on Camp Hill. But time goes by, lots of time goes by, and the Federals are kind of scratching their heads saying, what is Jackson doing? Well, what we really think Jackson's doing, he's trying to lull the Federals out of their rather strong defensive position, trying to make them attack him, but Saxton doesn't take the bait. He stays in position on Camp Hill, and he's basically saying, come on, General Jackson, you want to attack? Come right on. I am ready for you. Well, Jackson finally, on May the 30th, towards evening, just before dusk, will decide to launch an advance against Camp Hill. And just as he's beginning to make that advance, a huge thunderstorm erupts. Massive thunderstorm here uh, in the Blue Ridge and in the Gap at Harper's Ferry. It was such a massive storm that you couldn't tell really the, the reverberation of the cannon from the vibration created by the thunder of the storm itself. And so Jackson begins advancing in this massive storm. The artillery opens up. He comes to within 300 yards of the enemy position on Camp Hill, which means that he actually has left Bolivar Hill Heights. He's left Bolivar Heights. He's gone down that slope. And at the base of the hill, Camp Hill, where the Federals are in position, is where he finally stops, in the bottom of that ravine. It's obvious he's not going to be able to take the position. Darkness is coming on, and he will withdraw that night. And not only does Jackson withdraw from Camp Hill to Bolivar Heights, but he withdraws from the whole position. He leaves the area rapidly because Jackson will learn that Lincoln is trying to entrap him, that Lincoln has called for two federal armies to move against Jackson, to pinch him, to cut off his line of retreat in the valley in the vicinity just south of Middletown, Virginia, and in the vicinity of Strasburg. And so Jackson needs to get out of here because if he doesn't get out of here, he's going to have two federal armies that will trap him from the rear, and he needs to slip through that noose before it tightens around his neck. So Jackson withdraws from Bolivar Heights, leaves the area of Charlestown and Jefferson County, and it's a race south, southward up the valley. Jackson ultimately just does make it through that closing noose at Strasburg before the two Union armies unite. And that then leads to the remainder of the Great Valley Campaign, which will occur further south of us in the vicinity of Harrisonburg. And so, in sum, the only place where Stonewall Jackson will not rid the Yankees of the Shenandoah Valley in May of 1862 is here at Harper's Ferry. This will be the only place he will be stopped. This was perhaps one of the first instances that the United States will use the railroad in a rapid troop deployment to move troops during an emergency from one location, Washington in this case, to another, Harper's Ferry, to stop an enemy advance, and they succeed. If it had not been for the railroad, there's no way they could have gotten those Union soldiers out here quickly, and Jackson indeed probably would have forced the evacuation of Harper's Ferry and cleared the Shenandoah Valley of all Union soldiers. Only here was Stonewall Jackson stopped.